are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services. Nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Hi, y'all. This is Jenny Earhart, host of the Southern Sisters Radio Show, the show for Southern women and the men who adore us. Check me out on Saturdays at high noon right here on AM 920 The Answer. I'm in Wynn's World, and I love it. Hey, baseball fans. I'm Casey Motter. Welcome to Wins World. This is Larry WACHS of the world-famous WACHS Modcast, Atlanta's number one smartphone radio show on iTunes and Google Play. But that's nothing compared to Wins World. So I was reading uh, Chipper Jones' new book, Ball Player. What a classic. It took me back to the days I used to read. When I was a kid, I grew up reading all those baseball books, like Brooks Robinson's Autobiography. Oh, I love that Brooks Robinson's Autobiography. I just read that thing over and over again. This is what it's like to be Brooks Robinson. And nothing Brooks Robinson said was very interesting, but it was Brooks Robinson telling you what was going on when you're watching the games. And that's what it's like with Chipper's book. It's just a straight retelling of his career in simple jock language that anyone can enjoy. Now, did he write it, or was it one of those as told by? No, was, they're always ghostwritten. Right. Like, I was thinking of writing a book, and I got a ghostwriter. What would you call it? How to Be Me by Larry W.A.C.H.S. <laughs> it never got off the ground because I, I don't, I'm not ready to put it out yet. Yeah, there's too much life to live. That's right. Yeah, nobody cares about uh, the memoirs of an unemployed uh, talk show host. I wouldn't say that. But they care about it. Uh, the memoirs of an employed talk show host. And that shall be the story of the great lair right. very you, soon. you got to wait till all the chapters are written in your life before you can write about them. That's right. I just felt like it's a little premature. <laughs> no way I'm going to write it myself. I'm a good writer, but I, I'm not used to writing books. You know, there's a whole structure and a whole way to do it. The ghostwriter is telling me. You could do the, uh, <clears throat> the audible version, though. You could voice it yourself. Yeah, if I don't sound like a girl. <laughs> you don't. Yeah, yeah. I've been too hard on yourself today. <sighs> No, it's the pollen. It's just, hear it? My vocal cords are so constricted. So I'm very self-conscious about it. I understand. As you know. Your voice is your uh, your paycheck. <clears throat> That's right. If I sound like a girl, can't make the big bucks. No, you can't. Not in Atlanta. There's too much of that on the radio right now. No. So do you think if Jim Palmer wrote an autobiography that he would include He the did. Wax? Did he include the Wax family in that? No. What? <laughs> I mean, I, I like his kids. I'm friends on Facebook with his kids, but he, he, I don't know, he was a jerk to my dad or something. Something happened. If anybody let me stay in their basement, I would include them in my will. Yeah, right. You would think. Yeah. You would say, not a, maybe not the will, but at least your book. Show some gratitude. I stayed at the Wax's basement. Right. Well, they, let, they were so gracious that Lenny Wax would let me stay in his basement while I switched from one mansion to another. He was in between mansions. He's a highly played ball player. And uh, so he had all this down there. And then... Then he moved into the new houses. All his he left in my dad's basement to clean up. <laughs> all his trophies. I mean, my dad finally sold him on eBay for some cash, which I said, Dad, why don't you do this like years ago? And his name had some value. Right. So what was it about the uh, the baseball book by Larry Jones that you just fell in love with? It's just like what's going on when you're watching all these great games. It's Nothing's more satisfying to a sports fan than that. Right. Like what happened when you were talking on the mound this time? What happened with the roids? What happened with the drugs? What happened with the injuries? What happened with uh, Maddox being the grossest human? This guy is psycho, Maddox. Greg Maddox? Oh, my God. This guy is something serious. He's, he's going to kill somebody one day. Wow. Yeah. My prediction. He's a psychopath, Greg Maddox. Anybody's had dealings with him, but you got to read what he did in this book by Chipper Jones. Very nice. Let's see. What else has been going on? Oh, yeah. The Oakland Raiders move into Vegas. There was a really cool yard barker article basically debunking the hate 
about this move. Oakland is a broke city. They have a 13% poverty rate. That- wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yari Barker was writing about hate? Yeah, they were basically saying this is a good move for both cities. Okay. Because Oakland would have had to build... Why a- is it good for Oakland? It's good for Oakland because they can't afford to build a new stadium on the taxpayer dollar. Mm-hmm. The average person there makes 30 G's a year. It's never stopped them before. never right. stopped the city of Atlanta from putting a new stadium right next to the old stadium in a neighborhood where nobody lives. Sure, but it's not the no right No taxpayer thing. lives. Right, it's not the right thing to do, and I think they realize that. And Vegas is willing to fork over, I think it was uh, 600 or $700 million to give to them to build a stadium. I think it's terrible for Oakland. It's great for Vegas. Sure. It's not good for both cities. That's well, foolishness. Well, well, you know, if they're having to cut the education budget. Yard Barker, I imagine, is written by the, your typical left-wing uh, ideologue who happens to be in sports and who wants to throw something, a bone to Oakland, which is ideologically to their liking. You know, it's both it's a left-wing radical city. And that's why it's broke. And so this left winger is trying to tell the other left wingers in the government, oh, it's good for you. And it's, it's not. It's well, the worst thing that could ever happen to Oakland. I expect Oakland is going to implode, it's, as ma- many cities will, unless they're rescued. Oakland is, I think, already imploded. Well, it just sucks because that fan base there has kind of been ripped off. I get what you're saying, and I think it's absolutely right. But from a, an economic standpoint of having to build a new stadium off the taxpayer dollar, with people that make thirty thousand dollars a year, they make more than I do. It doesn't make sense. And in this world that it's we live in, it's not good. It gives it, it, those guys are desperate. Those Raiders fans come from a a desperate, tax depleted fan base. They're not good people. By the way, if you're from Oakland and you're fretting about your Raiders in the stadium, how about this? Make your city better. Go back to work. I mean, it's, the whole state is run by rich white people, and it's a cesspool of third world corruption. And Oakland deserved to lose that football team. And let me tell you something, you Oakland Raiders fans. Get to work. Fix your city, and maybe a football team will find it in their... I mean, you've got the Raiders, who are the craziest football team. They want to leave your city. Think about that for a second. Here's a sobering <laughs> thought. The craziest franchise in the history of the NFL, when Al Davis was there, you couldn't tell the difference between the Raiders and the XFL. That's how crazy... It, it was the prototype for the XF, XFL, the Raiders. This is the craziest team in the history of the NFL, and they just left your city because you're too out there. Vegas, and Vegas, in comparison to your city, seems a sane, safe choice for, that fran- for the craziest franchise ever. I mean, you've got to be taking a hard, hard look in your civic mirror, Raiders fans, because Oakland is now Moscow. It's Moscow. You've got Baghdad on the left with San Francisco, and then down a ways in Oakland, You've got Mecca. It's it's Islamic. California is in a totally is Sharia state. That's why the NFL left Oakland. I don't know why they went to Los Angeles, but I think that my prediction they're going to leave Los Angeles again soon. Right. Yeah. It's not going to work out there. I think it's going to be cool for Vegas, though, like you said. It'd be great for Vegas. Yeah. It'd be great for Vegas. They were talking about the uh, the median income 15 minutes away from the strip. It's like in the mid 60s, which is twice that of the people in Oakland. Which is really cool. So yeah. people have money to spend. It's a good thing, ultimately, for Las Vegas and Nevada as a whole. It's great. It's great for them. They win. They win. Las Vegas is a great all-American city to go to. Even though it's ghetto trash at the Wazoo, it's all-American. I want to go. I really want to go. I've mm-hmm. never been. Yeah, yeah. You got to go. Just go for two days. That's all you need. How many times have you been? My life have been uh, maybe five, nice. five or six. Five or six times. Very cool. Yeah. I think Oakland's fans may realize that their next step is being not part of the United States because that's coming. They better watch out. This is a warning shot across the bow from the NFL. You lose your NFL franchise, you're pretty close. You're that much closer to getting stripped of your United States citizenship. They're already dabbling. We had that game last year in Mexico. Yep. That's what I don't like about the NFL, their desire to be in other countries. I don't get it. I don't get the Europe thing. It doesn't work. They have enough. They have soccer. They have rugby. They don't need American football. No, and neither does America. America (laughs) doesn't need American football going over there. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. They want to watch people kick around a ball for two hours and no scoring. That's their prerogative. But here we have a game where people are tough and they score, just like men should should be tough yeah. and scoring. Now we get penalized for it. Yeah, it's get, awful. Men men should be tough and score all the time, and this football allows them to do that. But I, I I would like if the NFL took that energy and put a team in Montana 
Yeah, why not? There's nothing going yeah, on. Yeah, draw and take those Canadians and pull them over the border. Or put some of those refugees to work in Nebraska. No, like, you know, the refugee team. No, no refugees. If you can make it, if you make the team, then you can stay. If you're tough enough to make an NFL mm-hmm. team mm-hmm. and be over any, eight and eight. Nope. Plenty of Americans can play, ready to play football. Don't need refugees. Maybe we can use the ones that scale the Trump wall and get past the turrets and monsters. Well, there's something to be said for that. If you scale the Trump wall, there's a future thing with that. I think the government should put up some kind of, you know, reward. Like, yeah. certain periods, like during May, if you can scale the wall, first of all, you have to be in our army. Yes. For three years. Right. On the front lines. Right. And at least one deployment into battle. Right. And then if you survive all that, you're automatically a citizen. You don't have to pay any taxes either. Actually, I think uh, it should be anybody who serves in the military should be exempt from all taxes for the rest of their lives. I completely concur. That, that extends to police, fire, you know, first responders, EMTs. That would get a lot more people into the profession. It would just be a purchase tax. If I want to buy a big screen TV, I pay 10%. Instead of you pinching my wallet with the work that I do, I still don't understand how we've come to this place where we've just accepted the fact that the government just takes, and then when tax season comes around, oh, I got a return of 1500 bucks. That's your money. Why are we happy about that? I, don't, I really don't get it. Hmm. We, we have a tax season special. Go out and buy a new car. Go buy a TV. Go buy something that's fun. It's like, it's my money. People are emotional about money. You think, oh, get a check for 1500 bucks in the mail from the government. Oh, I'm a winner. You feel good. It's $1,500, like looking through a coat pocket, <laughs> right. finding a 10, and you didn't make any money, but you feel like you made some money. Sure. Yeah, it's money you didn't have. So it's very, that's why they do it that way. You just don't remember the day that you lost that 10 bucks and you were pissed off for the rest of the day. Right. And that's why they don't have anybody, uh, can, nobody writes a check on April 15th. They take it out, paycheck, drip, drip, drip. Every paycheck. That's what the genius of withholding. Right. It prevents people from really dealing with, you know, paying taxes. It looks, it's so transparent, they don't even realize they've paid a load of taxes. (laughs) And then if they have to pay more on April 15th, it makes them mad. But if they get some back, they think they got one over on the government. Which is one of the reasons why one of your old co-hosts always said, well, I, I just write the government a check for extra. I know that I don't owe them this much, but I just do it to keep them off my back. And I, I've always talked back to the radio and said, why would you give them more money just so they don't write you a letter? I don't understand that we've just become so submissive to this shadow force. Nobody thinks that but him. <laughs> just, I don't get it. For somebody that's so libertarian and less yeah. taxes, more freedom, I'm just, I, it blows my mind. It really does. All due respect. I'm not, I'm not dissing the man. I just don't get it. I don't know. You have to ask him. I wish I could. I know the answer myself. I'm scratching my head. It sounds, it sounds stupid. <laughs> yeah. it sounds self-defeating, but and people do all kinds of stuff. Break! Grab a beer and hit the head. In just a couple minutes, we're talking about a vacation. A vacation to outer space. Yes, this is feasible and realistic, but how much would it cost? We're back with Dr. Jeff Swearing of Reasons to Believe after this. Hey, y'all. It's Margaret, nutrition and eating psychology counselor. This is my absolute favorite time of year because it's when everybody starts becoming conscious of their choices and their health and their body. And I have a ton of ways to help you reach the best version of yourself. So reach out to me to find out about my summer programs. Email is nourish at margaretschwenke.com and on Facebook at Margaret Schwenke Authentic Nourishment. I'll talk to you soon. Hi, I'm Caitlin Carr from Reasons to Believe, and I believe that One's World is magnificent. This is Wind's World. It's weird science time. Oh, yes, it is weird science time. You know what's not weird is wanting to go on vacation. You know, Europe, Asia, Antarctica, South America. Some people want to go to space. And Dr. Jeff Zwerink, seasoned professional at Reasons.org out in California, is the guy to go to about all things space travel. Dr. Zwerink, welcome back to One's World. How you been? Doing well, Joey. How about yourself? I'm doing good. You know, we were in the middle of planning our next vacation. I recommended outer space, but my wife wants to go somewhere warmer. What say you on this? I am conflicted there. If you gave me a chance to go to outer space, that is one of those bucket list things that I will never get to do, but I would love to do. Mm. The only problem I have is that I have like family obligations, like a wife and kids and stuff. Uh, And you have a real large chance of dying when you go into space. And so I thought that's probably not the greatest idea. But I would love to do that if I had the opportunity. Well, some would say you have a fairly large chance of dying in third world countries. So really, which one provides the biggest bang for the buck? You know, I just could not 
that I could not fathom anything comparing to the idea of being on a rocket that's accelerating at multiple G's, just going up in and then being able to look back down on the Earth and mm. see what it looks like. That would be too cool, in my words. I, you know, just as a, how weird I am, I actually had an argument, well, not an argument, a discussion with a friend of mine in college, and we thought, you know, what would be the best ways to die? And one of the, one of the ways we came up with just to be up in space where your oxygen slowly fades out so that you just kind of slowly pass out, but you get to enjoy watching the Earth from space while you do it. So, you know, this is not a new thing for me. We've actually been, t- I've been talking and thinking about this for a while. Oh, uh, so. no, I've always been fascinated with seeing storm cells from above. I, I agree. I mean, there's just so many things about space travel that are, unique and unknown just because they're they're unique experiences and so i I think it'd be fascinating to do so uh i I, i'm very sympathetic and can empathize with the people who want to go off into space how is this happening and let's follow the dollar who's shelling out who's doling out them dollars to uh provide these people with space travel so this is uh, is elon musk uh yeah he's a entrepreneur very successful entrepreneur has lots of different buckets that he's got his uh Pouring, pouring water into, but he is funding a mission to go around the moon. And so, uh, you know, there's people have to pay a certain amount, and it doesn't disclose what that amount is, but uh, I think somebody was saying that Richard Branson and his Virgin Galactic, just for going up into orbit, was kind of a quarter of a million. So this is not your average tourist that gets to do this. Right. So you said they're going to be going around the moon. Any chance they're going to land on that big ball of cheese or what? Uh, not at this point in time. Uh, you know, at it, go, getting out to the moon and back is relatively straightforward. I mean, you know, you're traveling in space, so everything is hard, and there's always chances, of, or you know, when things go wrong, it's really bad. But uh, going to the moon, you just have to basically get enough energy, uh, you know, get enough velocity. The trajectory will take you out there. The moon's gravity will loop you around and send you back. So that's conceptually straightforward. Far harder is to get into orbit around the moon and then get something that can come off your spaceship and drop down and land on the moon. That is technically far more challenging. And so that's part of why we only did so many uh, of them, is that it was very difficult, very expensive to do. So this is just a loop around the moon and come back. In case you're just joining us, we are with Dr. Jeff Zwerink, Mr. Astrophysicist himself, a Ph.D. in astrophysics from Iowa State University. Uh, He holds a part-time research faculty position at UCLA. He's also an author and a loving father and husband. And that's your new dating profile in case things fall apart on your way to the moon. (laughs) Um, cause from what I hear, those Martian women are outstanding. I don't know. I've just heard. No, wait a second. I thought the men were from Mars and the women were from Venus. Well, you know, up there, there is no gender. They're just kind of uh, all the same. They're just people up there. Okay. They're, all right. they're, they're so, just all, I, I don't know all I, the I details think, yet. I think, I think I'll just <laughs> stick with my wife there. I think that's that just a lot safer and uh, far more uh, enjoyable at this point. So Indeed. I was hoping that you could, <laughs> you could comment on the rising prices of astronaut ice cream as well. Well, you know, I mean, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, it, it's hard to find out there. But I do know that all of the restaurants out on the moon, I've heard the food's great, but there's no atmosphere. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> But in seriousness, you did mention the danger. I mean, obviously, uh, leaving the uh, the Earth's atmosphere and then re-entry, the lack of oxygen, if you know we were able to get up there. What other dangers besides the inevitable spaceship, you know, trying to suck us in and use our brains as experimental grounds? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just it's one of those things that there's, you know, anything we do here on Earth has a lot of things that could go wrong with it. But one of the nice things about working here on Earth is that for the most time, if something goes wrong, you pull over to the edge of the road, you land or whatever, you get it fixed, and then you keep going. Right. Well, on a journey out to the moon, you're on the order of uh, eight days, if I remember correctly, in Apollo 13. It took four days out, four days back. And so you've got something on the order of six to ten days to get out to the moon and back, depending on how fast you go. The downside is that if anything goes wrong, you only have what's available to you there to fix it. And so if you have something where the oxygen recirculation system goes out or the oxygen tank that supplies the ship uh, depletes or you get a hole in the side of the spacecraft. You know, any of these things that, you, that's, that are very feasible to do and happen somewhat routinely, um, if any of those happen, you just have no way to fix it. And so you just kind of end up dying. And so uh, it's not so much that there's unusual 
things that might go wrong. It's just that all of the things that normally go wrong, they can be very catastrophic because there's little to no way to fix them out there. Right. So like a flat tire here on Earth, we call AAA or fix it ourselves. But out there, you're kind of, you know, SOL for the lack of a better term. It, it really is. And, you know, like I said, you know, we've got a pretty good track of where a lot of the space junk is out there. But if you have something that comes along and hits the edge of the spacecraft, and, uh, you know, one of the things you do with spacecraft is make them light because the more weight you put up in space, it gets more expensive. So you make them light. So if it would happen to penetrate through the hull of the ship, uh, you know, which is an unlikely thing, but, you know, unlikely things happen if you be out in space enough. And right. so something like that could be very catastrophic, especially depending on how quickly it was found and how big the hole was. Or, you know, like I said, uh, you know, even just something as simple as the things that circulate the air and remove the carbon dioxide and put oxygen back into it. I mean, if any of those things goes wrong, it's a difficult task to figure out how to deal with them. Uh, you know, and, and then you have to deal with all the things of what might go wrong out in space. So. Yeah, it doesn't seem like much of a vacation. It seems like you have to know how to fix a life and death situation. So one of the prerequisites that you mentioned was having money. You mentioned about $250,000 to go on this trip. But is there any other training involved or is it, you know, whoever has the deepest pockets gets to go on this ride? I mean, I, there definitely is training because, uh, yeah, you think about what you're doing. So you've got the you're on the launch pad, rocket boosts off, excitement, great. I mean, I, I, you know, I love roller coasters. That's just oh, yeah. the, the intense part of the trip. You get up into space, fire the rockets, you're off to the moon. For, let's just say, eight days, you're now sitting in roughly probably a six by six foot by six foot, maybe eight foot by eight foot by eight foot uh, cubicle with the same person for eight straight days, and you can't go anywhere. Mm. And by and large, the scenery never changes. The only thing that really happens is the moon gets a little bigger and the earth gets a little smaller. You know, you can't go outside and take a stroll. I mean, you can always take a nap. That's good. I guess you could take a good book and read. But, you know, in some sense, the trip to and from the moon, to me, would be rather boring. Yeah, you know, it's a lot like driving across Kansas or Utah there. There's some really fascinating places at the destinations. But there's a whole lot of flat in between. Yeah, I think I'll take my chances on a beach somewhere. You, you, have, <laughs> you have definitely converted me to stay on planet Earth for my next vacation. Well, I, I agree. I said uh, the, 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 the caveat I would have with that is if I had the chance to just launch in the rocket, circle around the Earth, and come back, that's one that I would take up on. The moon, it's interesting to go, but I think I could stay home. How much money would you be willing to part with to do just that? Uh, it's far more money than I will ever have access. To. I know that. Much. <laughs> this is awesome. Always fantastic to have Dr. Jeff Swearing in Wentz World. Of course, you can connect with the good doctor on Twitter at RTB underscore J Z W E E R I N K. Dr. Jeff, thanks so much for your time today, man. You're out of this world. Thanks, Joey. It's been a lot of fun. Right. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. Hey guys, has it been a while since you had a weekend to yourself, just you and the guys? Well, I'm Jenny Earhart, host of the Southern Sisters Radio Show. Tell that lucky lady in your life about the Pinners Conference. It's happening on April 21st and 22nd at the Cobb Galleria. You get a weekend to yourself and she gets to learn all sorts of delicious Pinterest recipes that she'll cook for you. That's a win-win. Just head to PinnersConference.com. Use promo code Southern Sisters to register and get free admission. Margaret Schwenke, so good to have you back in Wind's World. Thank you so much. It's really, really great to be here and see your face. Oh, thank you so much. You know, last time we were talking about the dad bod, as always, we're talking about 
health, fitness, wellness, diet, nutrition, all of those things. If you have been in Wen's World for some time, you know that she has a business here in Atlanta where she helps everybody aspire to their personal goals of uh, being the best that they can be. And today... She is in Wins World to talk about a 21 day challenge. You got to fill us in on the deets. Absolutely. First, I want to start with saying you look incredible. Thank you. Yeah, and amazing. So it's kind of like we're in resonant energy right now because um, I feel like you've been putting your health and fitness first um, lately, and it start it's really showing. So Thank kudos you. to you. Thank you. Yeah. So the 21 day challenge, I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, I've been a, a nutrition and eating psychology counselor. I started my practice in 2012 and I have been focused on working with people to help them reach their goals. And a lot of times, you know, that that's in a counseling or a therapy setting, right? They're coming to me to work through whatever the goals or excuse me, whatever the obstacles are that exist to reaching their goals. But what I have found is that um, people also really need practical tools for how to get where they're going to go, right? right? So um, in addition to just the concept of eliminating processed foods and eating more whole nutrient-dense foods, there comes a point at which if you really have specific goals, you need very specific tools. Sure. And so that is the purpose of this 21-day challenge is really to bring people together in a community setting. And it's not a physical, like, you know, in the room setting. It's an online community. So we're joining together through a private Facebook group. Um, and we're all following a personalized program, uh, but staying accountable to each other through the private Facebook group. Oh, how cool is that, staying accountable? I think that's one of the keys to success yeah. in any endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, having social support is a really, really favorable thing when it comes to reaching your goals, especially like health goals, weight goals, nutrition goals, fitness goals. So why choose 21? What's the significance of that number? Yeah. So it takes 21 days to build a habit. And um, and at that point, also with this program, people are really able to see results. So kind of the lay of the land is that in the beginning, I'm encouraging them to take a before picture, which is really in some cases a painful activity. I did one. Did you? I did one. It was... Looking at the picture, yeah, really, I just started laughing because I was like, dude, you are so fat <laughs> in yeah. all the wrong places. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is a reality check. Yeah, yeah, big time. Absolutely. When you let it go, like if you suck it in and like, <gasps> then you can look however you want. Mm -hmm. But when you really let it go yeah. and look at yourself for right. who you actually are in the mirror, because the mirror don't lie. Nope. You know, it's not a fun house with all those like cool mirrors. Right. My mirror at home is one of those good old fashioned, you see it as it is kind of things. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's kind of the first step, right, to acknowledging where we are. And then the program itself is comprised of a nutrition component and a fitness component, obviously the accountability component, um, and a meal planning component. So there's a nutrient-dense superfood smoothie, which we're drinking every day, and we are doing a minimum of a 30-minute workout. And the workout is personalized to the individual. So okay. there's like thousands of online workouts that are able to be streamed. So you can do this literally in your living room. Um, and then there's a meal planning component. So there is, um, it's like a, a, a visual reference to what your portions should look like, depending upon your specific weight, your specific activity level, what it's going to take for you to reach your your weight goals. So it's it's scientific at that point, right? Because anybody can say, well, I started eating salads and, you know, I lost a little bit of weight. Sure. You know, I started eating better. But like if you really, really want to get this in check and have a very specific result that you want to achieve, then we need specific tools to do that. So a lot of people are surprised to find out, Oh, that's what it looks like. Like, that's what a plate should look like in order for me to be able to reach my weight loss goals. So let's get, let's get into a little bit more about the nutritional aspect. You mentioned the superfood smoothie. What is what's in that? Yeah. So a lot. Of, so it's basically it is protein. It's it's plant based protein. OK. It's also uh, probiotics and prebiotics. Um, it's nutrient dense, so it's got a lot of adaptogenic herbs in there, and as well as I almost wish I had brought the ingredient label so I could kind of like speak to each different ingredient and what it does in the body. For me, you know, I don't do anything with my clients that I haven't done first. Like I try everything because I want to cool. feel, 
you know, I want to know what the results are. I worked for Whole Foods Market for four years, and I've also been in practice for myself with nutrition for t- since 2012. So I've seen a ton of products. Right. I've seen the latest and greatest in everything. This literally is like the best of all worlds that I've ever seen together in one product. I'm really skeptical. Like I'm not one of those people that buys into, like I said, the latest and greatest programs. But a lot of people, the reason that they're hanging on to weight is because they're, they don't receive enough nutrients in the body. So this is a way, one scoop of this a day, this is a way to make sure that you're receiving all the nutrients. It's hormone balancing. It gives the body energy and it helps the body lose weight. Now, would you be able to share what this stuff is in Wen's world or is this exclusive to the 21 day program? Yeah, you got to you got to ask to find out more. I, I like that. Yeah. I like that. I yeah. mean, you don't get the stuff for free, folks. Come on now, just because yeah. you're listening to the show. But this is the gateway. Then you, you're in charge of opening the door and walking through. So is this something that's already in the program or can people join from this point on? Oh, absolutely. People can sign up at any time. So I do run monthly groups, okay. starting to run monthly 21 day challenges. But again, being that you could do these things on your own and just be also be a part of the group, right? That that could be a rolling entry. So you could do it at any time and just start your own 21 days wherever you are. Right. So what's the best way that people can reach out to you and connect with that? Yeah, I think probably the, the best way is just to find me on Facebook at this point, Margaret Schwen. Swanky Authentic Nourishment. And that's S-C-H-W-E-N-K-E, right? You've done that before. I, once or twice, yeah. yes. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm on Twitter at, at Nourish ATL. And just reach out, you know, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the details of the program and find out which program is going to be right for you as an individual to reach whatever your goals are. And I know a lot of the listeners of One's World aren't social mediaites. Got it. So they could probably reach out through the the email, as it were, right? I, I would think that the email would be a great way to find me also. And it's nourish at margaretschwenke.com. Well, you were talking about the nutritional aspect, what a plate should look like. Can you give them a little teaser as to what they can expect to experience in this three-week period? Yes. From a practical perspective, you can expect to have a better handle on how you need to eat for your body to right. achieve the desired outcome you want to have, right? So you, you'll have more of a comfort level on how many vegetables through the course of a day you need, need to eat versus how many servings of protein versus carbohydrates versus healthy fats versus fruit, right? Because when you look at that mashup for each of us it's different okay so i have to stop you right there how do you find do you help people find that sweet spot for themselves yeah absolutely so based upon your body weight and based upon the physical level of activity that we're going to be embarking upon right there's a formula right there's a formula and it's based upon calories that is going to keep you where you are it's called your maintenance calorie range and then there's like calories above and beyond that are going to cause you to gain weight and then calories below that are going to cause you to lose weight. Okay. So it's really simple and you just do that math one time and then I know for you what all of the combination of each of those macronutrients is so that coming away from that mathematical equation, you know how many greens in the course of a day, how many fruits, how many proteins, how many whatever – And if you just follow that program for 21 days, I mean, everyone who I have done this with has experienced results. Wow, that's awesome. It's incredible to be able to give somebody a program that they can do on their own and that they start feeling really good and achieving their results and like looking better and then feeling better and having more energy and starting to lose weight. Like I just... I just love helping people feel like better versions of themselves. And it's like once the gates are open, it's on. I'm seeing people just take off with this thing, man. Yeah, it's like it's almost like an avalanche effect. So at the beginning, you start rolling down a hill and it really hurts because you hit this really bumpy rock. Yeah. But as you start gaining speed and momentum, the other things that we thought maybe weren't possible are within arm's reach. And then we're able to grab them because we see, hey, that last thing that I thought I could never do, I just did that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And like we were talking about earlier, you know, A lot of us have forgotten what it means to feel good. Right. You know, we're just in our autopilot routine of drinking our coffee and going to work and sitting in traffic and watching television. And that's, from my perspective, fairly mediocre existence if we're not challenging ourselves and if we're not feeling really good. Right. Right. So I just want to, you know, 
I just forever want to challenge people to feel good. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there that when they think about fitness, they get a little nervous, right? Because Mm -hmm. they've been out of the gym for a long time, don't really do much aerobic workout or cardio, and they're a little afraid that they could either re-injure themselves or just embarrass themselves. So how do you approach the tentative client in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. First, it starts with a decision, right? It starts with a commitment to yourself and, you know, am I committed to changing and being better? And then with regard specifically to the fitness component, there are beginner programs, intermediate programs, there's yoga and Pilates. And, you know, for me, it's less about, you know, the fact that you want to be like a pro athlete at the end of this. It's just about you getting your body moving. Right. And I'm, I'm your coach throughout this process. So, you know, message me if you're having struggles, you know, ask me questions about the nutrition component, like, ask me questions about where to get certain kind of foods or how to travel and do this or, you know, whatever. The the only one thing that I cannot do for you is come to your house and physically move your body. Like at some point you have to take responsibility for getting better and for having the body and the energy and the life that you want to have. How much does this cost? It's less than 200 bucks. Wow. Crazy, right? So it's, it's 30 days of this superfood formula it is a year access to the online workouts. And there are these workouts are like, I mean, there are like hundreds and hundreds of them. So like I said, there's like a three-week yoga program. There's Pilates. There's strength and weight training and all different kinds of, you know, of combinations. And then it is the meal planning system and a book to understand how to do this for yourself in your own home. So... Wow. So it goes way beyond the 21 days. This is a real lifestyle shift. Exactly. Yeah. And the way that I see it is it's it's really just giving people the tools to know how to do this in the beginning. Right. And to work with me for 21 days to kind of get some traction. Sure. And then keep it going. I mean, you you could just keep starting over with 21 days back to back to back or or now that you have the tools, you know, you may do it one month and then go back to a little bit more leisurely approach, you know, to food and whatever, if you're going on vacation and then come back to town and hit it hard for another 21 days, it's always available. So I love that you brought up the aspect of community because in my past, it's always been easier to give up on something when it's just me and nobody else knows about it, right? That accountability aspect of it. So go into the importance of this community that is being built through this 21 day program. Yeah, I would love to. I feel like that's such an important part of of this group. First of all, it's it's a group, right? So there's you you know, the, you're seeing other people in there who have made the commitment to themselves as, as you have. Right, all ages, I'm sure. All ages, all across the country. So wow. the one I'm doing right now, you know, there are people from Crested Butte, Colorado. There's somebody from Pennsylvania, New Jersey. A lot of people from Atlanta, like San Diego. I mean, there are people from all over. So it's just another really cool thing is they're bringing their culture and their perspective to the group, right? Right. So it's important not only for personal accountability, meaning um, if I'm having a rough day and I don't feel like getting up and doing my workout today, then I like look on Facebook and there's somebody who's literally having to like trudge through the snow Mm. in like Montana or Colorado to like get to their gym or whatever it is. Like, you know, that puts things in perspective a little bit, right? right? It's a little bit easier for me to get up and see, okay, we're in this together, right? So it's not only that, that piece is helping me, but then again, from the flip side, like how can I help other people? I have a responsibility to this group. I have a responsibility to check in and, and to say, hey, I'm here, I'm doing my thing so that I can help my fellow challengers right. that are doing this. So it really, I really love it so much because it's bringing all of these people together in a, such a good, positive space of motivating each other. Have you noticed uh, a bond being built within absolutely. this group of people? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The one that I did last month, like these people are still talking and it's great because one girl was like getting ready to go with her family to Disney World and she's like, how do I do this? And there was like three or four people piped up and they were like, oh, I've got these snack suggestions and this is what I did. And, and it's not just up to me as the professional who's like leading the group. It's all insights welcome. Like we're here to support each other and to help each other live healthier versions of our lives. It's really, really awesome from that perspective. It seems like one of those rare communities where everybody is facing the same direction, looking 
north, essentially, looking towards the the greater light and the better existence, which is kind of rare in society because sometimes we find ourselves surrounded by people, even that people that we choose to be hang around with every day that may not be taking us in the right direction, right? And ultimately, that's our choice. But going to a little bit of what we were talking about before we got on air about the importance of selecting the right kind of people to be around us as we go on this journey together. Yeah, that's such a great, great concept. Like, because what I'm finding as a result of bringing all these people together in these groups is that, you know, we're creating an environment for ourselves. Like we're really creating this conscious space. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I was, it was either a podcast or, or something I was listening to recently that was talking about, the importance of who you spend your time with. We are a combination of the five people that we spend the most time with. Mm. So um, first of all, to become conscious about like, okay, so if I'm the combination of the five people I spend the most time with, who are those five people? And is that okay with me? If I'm saying I want to have a healthier lifestyle and I want to be the best version of myself, But then I spend all of my spare time with people who don't have that same goal or who are, you know, complacent in their lives at this point. Right. Then those two things don't really line up. So there was an exercise associated with it that we were being asked to do. Mm. And it was to identify the five people who you want in your inner circle, if you will, identify three people that you would consider having more limited interaction with, and then come up with two or three people, if there are any in your life, that you've decided are not headed in the same direction and are not providing the kind of energy that you want in your life. Again, it's becoming really, really conscious about what it is that we have in our lives and where we're going. We are the sum of all of the substances that we take in, whether that be, as we're talking about more specifically, food or information, you know, the things that we read, the things that we look at on social media, education, like the things, the things that we went to school for, the things that we studied, right? Like all of that stuff shows up in our lives and as an endpoint, as who we are as human beings. So we just need to be really, really clear about what those substances are and how they're affecting us. The Out of Control Atlanta Traffic Watch. Continuing coverage of the I-85 bridge collapse and closure from The Voice. And the Wens, right here in Wens Row, Chris Monroe. Man, oh man. Oh, what a week. Indeed. You know, even coming down 75 and getting on the top end eastbound, I have noticed significant difference since this debacle took place last week. And luckily for most of us, it's been spring break, but that reprieve is over in mere hours. Give us a 411 on what's going on. Yeah, I think we saw just a little taste of what is actually going to happen this coming week as people are actually using 285 as what it was intended for. If you'll you'll notice the sign, say 285 Atlanta Bypass. Right. It was always meant to be a bypass around Atlanta for traffic that was just going, didn't want to take the city. The problem is, is that 285 not only is the bypass for all of the tractor trailer traffic that comes through Atlanta that's not making a delivery downtown, as a lot of folks know, it it is also a major north-south east-west thoroughfare that supplements the other expressway system. So now you've got all of the usual expressway traffic that would just go on into and through downtown is now adding on to the perimeter. So, in fact, over the weekend, we're going to see this, and then into next week, that 285 jam is going to become pretty lousy as folks use 285 as the alternate. And they've given a specific date or a goal date of completion of this project. What is that, June 15th? June 15th. Okay. And, you know, a lot of folks, and I knew better. Look, and again, it's just, it's experience, and I've I've dealt with maybe nothing of this magnitude, but I've I've seen some pretty major projects have to get done. Um, I knew it would just take a couple of months. You know, right. it's eight months. Just no, it's they. If you if you look to the latest shots in there, they've got that site demoed, man. I mean, they've got all three slabs, all three sections, all of the support columns. It's demoed. It's down to the red clay. Wow! In just like a week. You know, something that's concerning, the winds was on his way home last night, and I noticed on 575 between Bells Ferry and Highway 92 in Woodstock that they have the same spools of fiber optic cables just sitting there in between the north and southbound side. 
And uh, I'm kind of wondering what the heck is going on there. Have they not learned their lesson from what took place on 85? Maybe less crackheads in the Woodstock area. Well, you know what's funny is I've had a lot of people ask me about this, but those spools of fiber optic cable or that conduit in and of itself, I mean, think about um, just like PVC pipe. Right. You wouldn't think of a stack of PVC pipe to be, uh, it is flammable because it's made out of petroleum, obviously, but it's, it's very... It's, it's very stable, so it takes a hot fire to really get it going. I think what happened is is it's the situation where you had this, this, this crack dude or whatever living under this bridge. The report is that he started this fire. That spread to a lot of the wooden pallets under there and the, okay. the shrubbery around there, and then that got the... You know, got those those spools going, and they were all packed in there together. So I guess hindsight 2020... It's not like they were storing TNT under there, right. you know, or dynamite. I mean, it, it's it's not an a, an unstable product. Does that make sense? Sure, it does. Um, but the danger therein, I mean, is there any real difference than the situation out in Woodstock with all of this, all these construction supplies being concentrated in one general area? Well, I mean, I guess there's always a, you know, there's always a danger. Are they under bridges? No, and, it's out in the open. Okay, thankfully, well, yeah. But at the same time, you just wonder if somebody now knows how to do that how long it will be before that's the next debacle with all the construction taking place on those express lanes yeah not to mention it's it's still only a two-lane road on 575 as you work your way northbound there it's concerning to me and i know i I come across as kind of a one of those conspiracy (laughs) theorists here but hey this is i thought the tinfoil hat was just Oh no no no! I wear it every day. Okay, I thought it was just part of your 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 mystique and My, your the, the mystique, the the appeal in one's world. It is J Dub, but it is you know it, it does bother me that they're they're quick to just say, well, it can't happen here. Why not have these uh, on a truck and drive that truck back into a safe shelter and then bring it back as needed? You know, it's a it's a question I really can't answer. I you know I I think they would get a delivery of these things and they come and and you know because it's not a flammable substance like a benzene or kerosene or something or or fuel of of some sort or dynamite or something that was you know considered hazmat i mean it's not considered flammable or hazmat so i you know i guess if you really look at it if somebody wants to destroy something in atlanta but i think this guy was just whack on crack Crack is whack. Crack is whack, man. Whitney. Stick to the soft drugs, folks. What happened to the good old fashioned doobie? You know, <laughs> yeah, if you're right. gonna if you're gonna do drugs, enjoy it. Why would you want to feel all? Why would you want to start fire? Ugh. No pothead starts fires under bridges. You know what I mean? They just that's they, true. They just go eat. That's it, true. There's never like a violent crime or or destructive behavior that's gonna inconvenience Atlanta commuters for the next three months. I think it was just you know I, honestly, man. I think it was a perfect storm. I think it was just. The guy happened to live under there. Who knows what else he had under there? He may have had some accelerant type stuff, like if he was using kerosene to heat with or cook with. Or some lighter fluid that he bought at the five and dime. (laughs) Right? So, I mean, there may have been some other underlying circumstances that led to these spools going up. But I guess my point is, it takes a lot of ignition to get that stuff going. Now, once it got going, it was a hot fire. And the fact that those elevated decks are not that tall. Sure. And the fact that it was concentrated under there, it was hard for the firefighters to get to. So there was, it was just a, it was a perfect storm combination of things for it to happen the way it did. <laughs> Chris, always great to have you here, brother. Thank you for your time. Hey, you too, brother. Hang in there. Hey, hey, it's your friendly voice of Atlanta Traffic, Chris Monroe, on Twitter, at Atlanta Traffic. And check out the work I'm doing with my foundation, the Gift of Music Foundation. Giftofmusic.org. That's giftofmusic.org. Hi, this is Vinny Bucci, a.k.a. the Booch of the male soap opera moment. Make sure you check out the Booch cast Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio. Also, like the show on Facebook where you can find archived episodes. I'm in Wind's World, and I love it. I love me some good old-fashioned wrestling. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. This is your male soap opera moment. Indeed it is. And we are back with the one, the only, at Vince Bucci on Twitter. <laughs> yes, I am officially back from Orlando, Florida, and... um. 
You're, if you're wondering what you're listening to right now, it is the return of the greatest tag team in all of space and time. Mm-hmm. The Hardy Boys Indeed. returned at WrestleMania. And returned in grand fashion, stealing the Raw Tag Team Championship belts at WrestleMania. Man, oh man, what a fantastic ladder match that took place in Orlando. Vince Bucci in attendance. We're going to get some stories that Vince is going to share on our on-demand edition. So a little tease tease there. You can, of course, you can head to SoundCloud up in the search bar. Wen's World, W-E-N-Z World. But in the meantime, Vince, give us just a couple nuggets of your experience down in Orlando. Well, what's interesting is that fact that we're playing, we're on the subject of the Hardys, and it was crazy because when the Hardy Boys came out at, at the stadium, first of all, the new day comes out and the first thought you're thinking is they're about to put themselves in this match and i love how they alluded to that we had then all of a sudden when they said there's one more team we all knew somehow we all knew the hardys were showing up right and then as soon as the music played it was it was deafening it was insane it was crazy people were a little shocked to see them in the team extreme fashion and not the broken fashion that we've all uh, come to know and love about them but there's a lot of mixtures of different rumors i think it's because the hardys are currently in a lawsuit with tna because they claim the broken gimmick is their idea mm. which is a bunch of bs to any wrestling fan out there that knows this the hardys came up with this idea they're not tna is not creative enough to come up with something as brilliant as this. So now they're on this ongoing lawsuit. I think once the Hardys win the lawsuit, maybe we'll see the broken side in WWE. But until then, we got the Hardy Boys Team Extreme. Matt can still allude to it and play around with it. And he's such a genius at this point in his career that he knows how to still get the crowd on his side. And it was awesome. And what's even more amazing was that I had just met the Hardys that afternoon. Which was crazy. Oh, so cool. They had this, they had this uh, broken tailgate party that I kind of brought up on last week's show, mm-hmm. and we go. It was amazing. Like Matt's there, Jeff is there, his wife Rebby is there, uh, Senior Benjamin, who's basically Rebecca's father in law, but he plays a character called Senior Benjamin, where he plays like Matt Hardy's personal gardener, but is also like one of his like it's like it's like, it's like a manager for the Hardys. In TNA, where he basically comes out with a shovel that says delete, and he would hit somebody with it, and he's just, <laughs> or he would take somebody out with a taser. Like Senor Benjamin's nuts, nice. And his only things he knows how to say is "see, si, Senor." That's all he knew how to say. It was great. So they were all there signing autographs, taking pictures, um, and then of course afterwards we went outside, and there was a bunch of uh, indie shows. So basically, they were showing like some indie wrestling matches, like people from like all like like the young like young wrestlers from across the country were coming to these shows to you know entertain on WrestleMania weekend. In fact, one here from here in Georgia. Whoa, whoa, whoa. you're gonna have to share that on the on demand edition. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay, one there was one from Georgia. I won't say who it is yet. You have to listen, but it, 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 I got a hell of a story for that. As Funaki would say. Indeed. <laughs> Amen. So let's go. Let's recap Mania 33. Uh, took place last Sunday. But let's start with the, the best first. Of course, the two major championships on the line. The Universal Belt, which uh, right now is being held by one Brock Lesnar, defeating Goldberg in fine fashion, I might add. That match was awesome. And here's and a lot of people I've been listening complain about the match should have gone on longer. Why yeah, they did yeah. ev- they did everything you need to do? Now you'll notice that if, if you guys th- those that follow me on Twitter, you know I post the results as pay per views go on. And one of the hashtags I put was two moves is all it took." And a lot of people misinterpreted what I meant by that. They felt like I was mad because it was just two moves involved. No, what I meant by that was this is my meaning: spear, jackhammer, Goldberg. You have suplex, F5 from Brock Lesnar. Mm-hmm. They took those two moves and did everything a professional wrestling match is supposed to do. They told a story. They kept the audience on their feet. They got over. They got heat. They had cutoff spots. There was a high spot when Goldberg speared him through the barricade. Yeah. They had only two moves and told a story in the ring better than most the wrestlers that do the acrobatic stuff. Like, it was everything it needed to be. Especially when Lesnar kicked out of that jackhammer, oh, yeah. the stadium blew up. Well, nobody saw that coming. Like, I thought, oh, here we go again. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the fact that he kicked out, and if you look on the, on the uh, outside the ring, Paul Heyman had head and hands there. And for sure, just based on his body language, I thought, oh, this match is going to be over. On to the next. But sure enough, he kicks out, and then he comes back, And what I loved about this was that he ended up showing up on Raw the next night. But before we jump across that bridge, let's cover some more of the other matches. The other championship on the line, the WWE Championship, right now being held on the SmackDown brand. Randy Orton defeating 
Bray Wyatt. What do you think about this match? I want to get your take on this, Admin Spoochie. I got a lot to say about this match. Okay. Uh, competitively, it was great. Um, my issue was, I had two issues with this match. One, should have been the main event of the night. It wasn't. I was not happy about that. Mm. Number two, what the hell was the point of all the bugs? I didn't get it. Like, they have this like mind game that Bray Wyatt's trying to play. First of all, maybe if you're sitting at home, you guys could understand it. But in the stadium, we're all confused. Like, what the hell are they doing? And, and, right. and first of all, if you're going to let Bray Wyatt play mind games, let that be a method he uses to win the match. Yeah. Don't have Bray do all this amazing stuff and then RKO Orton wins. If, if Randy was going to win, you might as well just made it a normal match and then save that for the rematch if Bray because eventually Bray will get a rematch for the title. Sure. And if he used to win the title back, let him do the mind games then. Like, that's the only thing I didn't like was if you're going to do something amazing like that, it's got to lead to the win. Right. It's got to be the thing that takes Randy out of his game completely and allows Bray to hit his sister Abigail and retain the title. And it didn't do that. So I felt that the execute while the, while the actual in-ring wrestling was great – all that outside stuff took away from it. So this was a disappointment. Yeah, I, I totally get where you're going. They went with three different angles there. They did the uh, the grub. Then they did, uh, I think, cockroaches and something else. I can't remember. But I, I thought similar things. I was just like, well, with all this, he better win the match. And sure enough, he didn't. Um, I thought the in-ring, like you said, was amazing there. Uh, the United States Championship match. Kevin Owens defeated Y2J, the Ayatollah of rock and roll, Chris Jericho. Um, I'm glad he did because it does lend credence to him dropping the universal title and reclaiming some sort of gold. Yes, and uh, so I was glad to see Kevin Owens win because um, for those of you that don't read the, the dirt sheets and stuff, Jericho is eventually going back on the road with Fozzie. So it was right. He was, it was acceptable for him to drop the title uh, to Kevin Owens. Although I got to say the match was... It was it, that was a tough match because it was on the one hand it had a great story that everybody was willing to follow yeah but the match before that when we get to that was so amazing they couldn't follow it like the crowd was worn out from the first match so when Jericho and Owens were out there literally no one was paying attention everyone's talking to each other some people maybe in the on uh, the lower rows might might have been chanting like if they were up front but most of the audience was pretty much dead for that match like they the the match before that sucked all the energy out and I can't wait to tell you why. But Jericho and Owens was a bit of a disappointment. It didn't live up to the hype. So let's cover this uh, AJ Styles Shane McMahon match. What say you at Vince Bucci? I'm going to take a quote right now from Ace Ventura. Man, I'm tired of being right. <laughs> <laughs> I everybody out there was telling me AJ Styles can't. Why is AJ Styles working with Shane McMahon? Shane can't wrestle. This is going to be a boring match. Once again, the boot. There's a reason I'm called a wrestling expert, ladies and gentlemen. I watched this match. Even I was blown away at how well A, Shane wrestled, and B, how well these two were together. Mm. And this further proves why AJ Styles is one of the best, if not the best, wrestler in the world. Right. He complimented Shane's style. And of course, the ref got knocked out, so Shane could do his high spots, the, the leap of faith, the coast to coast, everything. But Shane showed. He's doing arm bars. He's countering moves. AJ goes for a 450 splash. Shane caught him and locked him in a hell's gate, which blew the roof off the place. Yeah. Then AJ counters that into a Styles class, which he met, which he botched. Which he botched. Right. He only got one. Yeah, yeah. He got he got one arm wrap, but he didn't wrap the other arm, which could have killed Shane. So I was a little scared about that. Like, dude, you sh I think Styles was moving so fast. It's like, dude, should have slowed down a little bit on that one. Right. But aside from that. That match had everybody up on their feet. It was insane. It, it stole the show, and it was the opening match. So the only complaint I have about that being the opening match was that, like I said, Owens and Jericho could not follow that, and the crowd was dead till the Hardys came out. Mm. Like, it, 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 it killed all the momentum for the other two matches because they were so great. It's like Styles won the fight, Shane won the night by proving he can wrestle. You know what? We're going to bring that said momentum on to the on-demand edition here of the Male Soap Opera Moment, featuring the one and only at Vince Bucci on Twitter. Follow him there. Get more information about the Boochcast, but you'll hear a whole lot more about the WrestleMania card itself. In addition, Raw recap as well as SmackDown Live. On behalf of the Booch, have a nice day. Bang, bang.